Thank you all for being here. My name is Penny Wright. We're delighted to have uh, have you all here, and to have Adele Christensen, who's been a visitor to our library for a lifetime, to talk about subjects involving energy and healing. And today she's here to complete the sort of part two of another energy and healing evening. Some of you know Adele already, but for those of you who don't, she is a Brennan healing science practitioner. She attended the Barbara Brennan School of Healing, which is a very respected entity. Um, in addition to performing healings on people as well as animals, she practices remote viewing for psychic search and rescue cases. Adele is also an EMT with the Southampton Volunteer Village Ambulance and a prayer chaplain with the New Thought Spiritual Center. I'd like to mention, and maybe she will as well, that on May 20th, Adele is organizing an evening here at the library at 5.30 to give us an idea of what a day in the life of uh, an EMS worker is like, and I do hope you'll all come to that. She combines practical understanding of biology and physiology with metaphysical applications of prayer and intention. Her interest in healing began about seven years ago. Before that, she spent 30 years as a businesswoman in the corporate and nonprofit sectors, where she speci specialized in marketing, uh, advertising, public relations, program development, and public advocacy. We're so grateful to her for being here again. Please welcome Adele Christensen. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out on a cold February night. And um, if you've attended any of my previous talks, uh, welcome. Our series is continuing, and tonight we're going to be focusing on unified fields. How's that? Is that okay? Is that okay? So today we're going to deepen our exploration of how energy comprises us and connects us. And we'll share some more exercises to help you use your own energy field and your own high sense perceptions. Some people call high sense perceptions ESP. Everybody has it, even you. And you already know it. You just don't think you know it. Um, so we'll be working with our high sense perception to explore how we process information and uh, respond to the energy fields of individuals and groups. So this presentation is about contact. It's about experiencing your field and another's, whether they're in this room here or they're halfway around the world. It's a full contact sport. And contact isn't necessarily what we experience out there. It's how we experience it in here. And what I feel inside me is generally how I'm learning and receiving and assimilating data about what's going on out there. So I am my own tuning fork. Come on in, guys. Welcome. Um, so these, as, uh, as Penny mentioned, are some of the fields that I belong to. And I'm going to invite you to consider what are some of the fields you belong to. So our family is a field. Um, our family of origin is a field. Our workplace is a field. Um, we belong to many, many groups and many, many fields. So what is an individual field? Well, a field is an area of activity. It's a complex of forces a construct of analysis, of remote effects. It's an area of understanding, a place of shared activity, a composition of energy that surrounds electrically charged particles. Our seven major chakras metabolize energy from the universal energy field to bring us information and nourishment. Energetic data is just as important and vital to our well-being as the air we breathe, 
the food we eat, and the water we drink. Each chakra transmits energy to specific aspects of our central and peripheral nervous system, our endocrine system, and all our organs. Each chakra is associated with a psychological function and a high sense perception. As we learn to open and balance our chakras, we develop our high sense perception and we fine tune our receptivity to data from the universal field. So you have an electromagnetic energy field. It surrounds and permeates your physical body and it extends about two and a half feet beyond your physical body. Now that's just using your seven chakras, more on um, the outer body chakras, maybe in another talk. Each chakra supports a different level of this energy field, and each level of our human energy field, or aura, vibrates at a different frequency and contains different aspects of our experience. So there's a level for our physical, a level for our emotions, our spiritual aspects, our mental aspects. Our field even contains past experiences and experiences that have yet to happen. By modulating our chakras like the aperture of a camera, we access levels of our human energy field to connect with individual and group fields. So your human energy field is your tuning fork and your chakras are your apertures to focus it to pick up whatever information you want. By modulating your chakras and setting your intention, you can tune your high sense perceptions to access any energetic field you want. What you access clairvoyantly depends on which levels of a field you tune yourself to. By tuning our clairvoyant perception, just like the lens of a camera, to different levels of the universal field, we can tune ourselves to see a wide range of events, places, or people, or other aspects of consciousness. Or we can fine tune our focus to pick up fine microscopic events at very, very close physical levels, like a Lyme disease spirochete inside a human brain or where the ends of a fractured femur might rub against a femoral artery. We can expand our clairvoyance to larger fields to see where insurgent troops are gathering along the Afghanistan border halfway around the world. By fine-tuning your clairvoyance to the fourth level of your field, you can see disembodied spirit or guides. By tuning into the sixth level of the field, you can access the consciousness in the angelic realm. So as we've reviewed in prior talks, these are some of the high sense perceptions that we use to ascertain data from the universal field. And yes, you all have them. But like any muscle, if the more you work it, the more results you'll get. So how many of these senses do you use and consciously develop? Authors like Nancy Tatotra, who wrote Psychic Intuition, believe that the sixth sense is a myth. That psychic people like myself aren't special. We're just using more of our sensory mechanism to get data that's available for everybody. Scientists now believe that there are many, many more than five senses originally defined by Aristotle in 350 BC actually more like 40, and these include senses that are calibrated by organs, such as our sense of time, our sense of direction, our sense of danger, our sense of magnetic fields, our sense that something's about to happen. So what is a group field? Where and how do the individuals in a group field interconnect? How does a group field know for itself? How does the individual know for its group field? A field is a physical quantity that has a value for each point in space and time. Yet now science is measuring the connective substance or intelligence that connects each point. Some people call this God. 
Fields are characterized by their coherency and their intention. I use my own coherency and my own intentions to connect with any field that I want. I use my body awareness to tune into the group field and to inform me of its characteristics. I'm tuning into this field. The field may be universal, but we are not. The field is a unifying intelligence and it's experienced by all of us, yet each one of us experiences our own particularized part of the field. So I'm in this field, yet I'm also experiencing it. What I might ask myself is what am I bringing to this field? What you might ask yourself is what are you bringing? What are you experiencing? What are you picking up? What are you noticing about yourself that you didn't notice before you entered the field? Let's do some field work now. I'd like you all to relax and put both feet firmly on the ground and to sit up in your chair. And I'd like you to connect with your root chakra down into the earth so that you're grounded and breathe up through the root chakra all the way through your vertical power current which runs along your spine and exhale out the crown of your head. I want you to inhale through the crown of your head, bring your breath down through your spine and exhale it down through the floor. Feel the rhythm of this movement as your breath flows up and down your body. Feel the different sensations in your body as you still yourself. Now, I want you to open your awareness to the outer, the outer limit of that two and a half foot field we talked about. And I want you to focus on this field. What do you know about this field? And contribute. So call out, just raise your hand and call out what information you get as you sense into this field. Warmth. Warmth. What else? Density. Density. Curiosity. Curiosity. Movement. Movement. To me, this field feels very lacy and fine. Look at the filaments. Look how artistic it is. There's a real artistic beauty to it, a symmetry. It feels very morphic. It feels very dense along the edge here. This is Dubai. This is an aerial view of Dubai. Okay, open yourself to sense in this next field. Which field? Right here. What do you understand about the intelligence and the intention of this field? And sense into the way it has composed itself. What strikes you about its Self-organization. I'm here. I'm seeing this. So, like, it's along the sinuous backbone, right? What else are we getting? Central symmetry. symmetry. There's a lot of symmetry. What else? You're getting a bad vibe from that picture. That's important. Oh, terrible vibes. It, it looks very um, man, man dominated, doesn't it? And, and it looks like all of this activity is clustered around the central nervous system of this body of water, right? This is Marina Bay in Dubai. Okay, so this is a closer look at that larger field that we were uh, looking at before. All right, here's another one. How 
does this field feel to you? Spacious. Spacious. What else? Gentle. Gentle. Soft. Soft. Serene. Serene. What sense of movement do you get from this field? Slow movement. Slow movement. How does this field establish and maintain its own coherence? It's natural. What was that? The wind, right? What elements are compri are, 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 are creating this or f what elements do you sense in this field? Somebody said wind. What else do we sense? Water, sun, sand, air, heat. What else? Air. Air? Yeah. Does this feel very uh, rugged and austere to you as well as soft? To me, it feels really chiseled and hard. Makes me wonder about the people who would live here. Those are shadows. So what we're looking at are dunes that have been etched. This is the edge of the Namib Desert in Namibia. All right, here's another. Are you guys warming up yet? Okay, what do you understand about the intelligence and intention of this field? Creative agriculture. What else do you get? Does this field feel fluid to you? Is this field beautiful? I think it's gorgeous. Look at all the colors in this field. <laughs> Do you get a sense of movement from this field? Yes. Yes. Do you get a sense of harmony between man and, and this area? This has a different relationship with man than the uh, marina in Dubai, doesn't it? That other one felt very choked, right? It feels like that man is sort of bond with the curves of the Man is gone with the curves of nature. Man is allowing nature to inform this field, right? Man is not imposing man's own will on this field. Any other observations? Cooperation. Excuse me? Cooperation. Cooperation. Yes, look at all the intricate sections to this field and look at all their colors and how they're finely patterned and how the pattern works together and how the pattern is very fluid. These are terraced rice fields in China. So there is a big fluid water element. What do you understand about the purpose and the force of this field? What's that? Weeding out the bad. Weeding out the bad. Oh, so this is this is um, an exit. This is a flushing. That's interesting, right? So you're sensing a flushing, a huge flushing mechanism for for the earth. What else are you sensing? Right, there's a there's a, a plateau, there's a shift in altitude, there's a huge drop here, isn't there? So what would that tell you about the energetic value? Does this field have a lot of force in it? Is this a highly active field? Does this field feel more forceful than that clustered Dubai uh, marina? <laughs> yeah. This is uh, Niagara Falls in New York. So how about this field? Do you get a sense that a field can serve multiple purposes? What do you, what, what does this field inform you of? 
Agriculture. Agriculture. Someone said tulips. Yes, this is a tulip field in Holland. And what do you sense about the relationship in this field between the tulips and the agriculture? What's that? There's a working with. There's a working relationship. Very organized. Very organized. Does this does this field have good boundaries? <laughs> wow, these are very symmetrical man-made boundaries, aren't these? What else is informing you in this field? The wind. wind. Yeah, the wind, right? And also the the uh, the canal. So you don't get a sense of um, in imposed industrialization, right? Somebody is living in a house on land, and somebody is living in a house on that barge. I think. Ah, so you see multiple lifestyles in this field. Do you get a sense of the intelligence of the tulips? Fusai, you're the gardener here. What are these tools? Programs where they create new varieties and things. Cross so these are working tulips, right? Oh, yeah, highly intelligent. Yeah, these aren't just your regular uh, recreational tulips, are they? What are they grown for the grow? Yeah, they're grown. These tulips are the tulips that are flown, right, around the world when they're harvested. Okay. So last time, we finished with a great photo finish. In our last presentation, who, who was here last time? OK, so a good number of you were. Um, for those of you who weren't, this group really rocked last time. Um, what we did was uh, we sensed into the field of this young man in this photo. And here's how, and this was a photo of a young man that was brought by a woman named Carol. We'd never met her before. She's not here tonight. And this is her son. And uh, here's how this group rocked. Here's how well they did. We, they engaged, you engaged your high sense perception and used this group field to pick up information in that field depicted by that photograph, okay? And you opened yourself up, and remember one person said, I feel sadness? And then another person, so that was an emotion that was picked up through your second chakra, right? So you felt the sadness, that's how you knew it was there. Next, somebody picked up on death, I feel a death involved here. So that person was using their intuition. That was registering in the solar plexus. That's the gut feeling. The next person said, there's been a car crash. And then someone else said, oh, that crash involved a drunk driver. So those two people got hits like that. And that was direct knowing. That's using your seventh chakra. When information arrives and you don't know where it comes from, but you just know it. So, then Carol got up and explained the photo. And she said, well, this is a picture taken of my son. And it was taken 30 years ago. And 10 years after this photo was taken, he became very sad because his father was killed in a car crash by a drunk driver. So that's how much information this group picked up from the field of that young man in that photograph. So you all accessed information across the time-space continuum. You picked up information in 2015 from a photo taken in 1985 of an event that was to occur 10 years later. Not too shabby for the first time out of the time-space box, right? I'd like to draw your attention to two things that happened during that moment when we were together last time. The first is the Picasso effect. This is a sensory phenomenon, much like the cubist art for which it's named. When we see multiple 
or simultaneous viewpoints that assemble together quickly and collectively to build a larger picture. Yet the larger picture is fragmented, distorted, and nonlinear. When we open ourselves to receive information from the universal field, data arrives in a fragmented, nonlinear stream. So, if you're getting a really nice, tight story, you're in your left brain and you're fantasizing. If you're getting something that surprises you, you're on target. So this is known as the Picasso effect. And there comes a moment right before the, the information arrives where you feel this sort of vacuum, but then you get this feeling like, oh, this is big, I know it, I know it, it's big, it's bigger than me. And that's because it is. It's from the universal energy field, but you're picking up on it. The second phenomenon that I want to draw your attention to is how we collectively accessed that data about Carol's son. So anyone who was here last time may recall that at first people were shy, you know, I don't want to call out, I might be wrong. But then one person said something and then it sparked somebody else and that sparked somebody else and pretty soon people were popping like popcorn with their information. The field built on its own sense of surety. Once we got past the impulse to disregard our intuition and our direct knowing, we created a more receptive state. And it was almost as if where one person got information, they created and made it easier for the next person to get the information. Now when we're working with the one brain, that is called um, creating a neural pathway, right? In a brain, when you learn something new, you create a neural pathway. Yet, and that's how we build a brain's plasticity. But when you're part of a group, so now you're one cell in a collective brain, your immediate moment of recognition creates a synapse for other people in your group field. So that's one way that a group field gets to become more intelligent. It's through knowing itself and receiving those new neural pathways. So where we're going with this is the hundredth monkey effect. Has anybody heard of that? Some people debunk it. It was, um, basically it purports that once awareness reaches a certain critical mass, it can jump past time and distance. And the story of the hundredth monkey was first observed by Japanese scientists. And they were conducting a study of makake monkeys on the Japanese island of Koshima in 1952. And they observed that some of the monkeys learned to wash sweet potatoes and gradually this new behavior spread through the younger generation. And much in the usual fashion, so the younger ones observed and repeated. Yet, Watson concluded that the researchers observed that once a critical number of the monkeys, the so-called hundredth monkey, was reached, the behavioral knowledge spread across the water to monkeys on nearby islands. So, I believe this is what Malcolm Gladwell is referring to in his book, The Tipping Point. And he says that the tipping point is that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. He says, in the end, tipping points are the reaffirmation of the potential for change and the power of intelligent action. Look at the world around you. It may seem like an immovable, implacable place, but it's not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be tipped. That's how revolutions happen. That's how political structures change. That's how our health changes. We all have many, many tipping points in our lives, and we all have tipping points in our fields. But more on this later. 
So this is a slide I'm repeating because I love Rupert Sheldrake. And he posits a theory of morphic resonance. And it says that memory is inherent in nature and that natural systems like termite colonies and murders of crows and molecules or cancer cells inherit a collective memory from all previous things of their own kind. Jung called this the collective unconscious. So Sheldrick says that morphic resonance is what's responsible for the, tele the telepathy type interconnection between organisms. Mm -hmm. And he, David Bohm, Carl Jung, and neuro and, and uh, biophysicists like Bruce Lipton are now bringing forth evidence that challenges our understanding of the brain and, and memory, much like Columbus challenged our understanding of the Earth being flat. Maybe what I know as memory and knowledge doesn't reside in my brain. What if my brain is a receptor of a collective consciousness that resides in a universal field? So all this information isn't squished inside here, but this is a beautiful receptor for all the information that resides out there. And my body is my way of interpreting these collective events into some sort of sensory perception. So we're all connected, we're all part of the divine matrix. And as new thought uh, and science of mind people believe, the universal field, God's substance, is holographic. So any portion of the field contains every portion of the field. So I can access time, I can access information beyond time and space, and we proved it last time because you all accessed information about Carol's son that was clearly beyond time and space. You prove that to yourselves. So information in the past, present, and future, or across great distances, is available to us here now. And really, the only point in time that we have is now. That's it. So wherever you are, your energy field is connecting with a larger energy field. Your chakras are picking up extraspectral frequencies or vibrations that are emitted through the universal field. And they're arriving within your central nervous system as direct knowing, intuition, gut feeling, a feeling of an emotion, a sense of time, a sense of danger. It's knowledge without a parent source. So physically in our brain, perceptions occur at the crossroad of thinking and sensing. And isn't it interesting that our brain actually has a crossroad between the two hemispheres, right? We have a left brain and we have a right brain, or a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. So our imagination is where the brain images its perception. Some people are considering that perhaps our imagination could be our largest sensory organ. The reason psychics can imagine things in their mind that end up as accurately predicted events in reality is because we use our mind as a sensing instrument. So with respect to our imagination, you're less of an inventor than you are an interpreter of images. So whichever field we want to access, we need to learn how to slow ourselves down to receive sensory data and to allow it to register in our nervous system and to arise our conscious awareness without subverting it to analysis or dismissing it with logic. And I do that all the time. Ah, can't be. Now, I'm just, I'm just imagining that. But then I have to say, of all the things I could have imagined, why would I be imagining that? That's your left brain trying to rain down on the reception of your right brain. 
So to develop our psychic awareness, we need to let our right brain lead this dance. Our right brain is where we receive inspiration and raw data from the universal field. If you are, at, does anybody here do psychic or mediumship work? When we are consciously using our psychic abilities, you can talk to spirit and cut a deal and say, I want to get information through my right brain and I want to feel it coming through my right brain and spirit will cooperate. And if you feel something in your left brain, you'll know, ah, that's my imagination, I can disregard that. Because all I'm interested in is evidentiary-based data and information coming in through my right brain, and spirit will cooperate. I cut that deal. Uh, so can you. So with practice, we can learn how to straddle between our two brains' hemispheres. And that's where we learn that not knowing is the safest place to be. And that when we're surprised about something is generally when we're on target. So our experiences give our sensory input a reference point and form the, and form the basis of our psychic vocabulary. Our senses and our subconscious decode the information we receive according to our own understanding and interest. So the images we may receive may be ours personally or they could be those of the target or a universal symbol. So for instance, this was a remote viewing uh, exercise I was doing, and um, I was told to ascertain if my target, a young girl, was dead or alive. So I asked, what's your current physical state? And I drew what I received. I saw a bouquet of flowers. Well, to my imagery, a bouquet of flowers represented a funeral arrangement. So that was my brain's way of saying that um, this girl is dead and she received a proper burial. So that's when I discovered I could do mediumship because I'm like, are you dead? Do you know you're dead? I asked her that before I even like could stop myself, and I was so surprised because what I got back was I may be dead, but I'm not stupid. I was like, oh my god, okay. And I asked her, you know, what do you miss about not being alive? And she said, well, I wish I played with my little brother more. So, but you or you or you might pick up something entirely different, and you might pick up that death in another way. You might see a skull form or you might just get a feeling of how she died and you will feel that kinesthetically in your body. So the trick is learning how to slow ourselves to receive sensory data and to bring it into our conscious awareness without distorting it. Our trick is to let the Picasso pieces fall into place one by one without imposing our own sense of order, rationale, or storyline, and to acknowledge where we feel resistance. So let's practice now. Relax, connect, and again, I, I recommend connecting with your feet on the ground. It's a great way to connect when you're grounded. Become, uh, listen, become aware and report. So this is the same sequence we use when we go inside to check with our inner wisdom and to telepathically connect with anything, whether it's an animal, a plant, a disease, or somebody who's died. Settle yourself quietly, dismiss that hundred monkey chatter, Open your eyes and connect to this face. What does this face tell you? And don't be shy. I need you to speak up. Sad. What's that? Sad. Sad. Hopeful. Defeated. Hopeful. What was that? Defeated. Defeated. Is somebody making... Somebody keep in track of, okay, so we've got sad, hopeful, defeated. What else are we feeling? I don't know why, but I got the picture of an ocean and a life saving. 
an ocean and a lifesaver, okay? What else? I don't think he wanted his picture taken. I can't hear you? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't think he wanted his picture taken. You don't think he wanted his know. picture taken? <laughs> Just in that moment. I don't know. So you're picking up on uh, some like keeping of a distance, maybe a barrier, right? You're yeah. picking up on a barrier between him and the viewer. Yeah. Maybe a barrier between him and you. What else? Oh, so you're feeling a mask in this face of another feeling. So let's deepen into contact. What else are we feeling? Or sensing? Or knowing directly? Or getting a gut feeling? Anxious. You're feeling he's anxious. What else? Is somebody t would somebody please take notes and scribe for us? Good. Did you get that? So you feel that he went through something something hard and sad. Hard and he sad. To someone else. He's just to Maybe having feel. to do with somebody else. Okay. What else are we sensing? Yes. Um, I don't know how, but I feel like he may have had children. You feel he may have had children. I don't okay. Know. Don't, don't disregard that. Good for you for speaking up. What else? His eyes. You know, can somebody help me with this? Um, His eyes. Can somebody help me? Pain. Maybe. Pain. Can somebody help me? What else are we getting? You guys are on a roll here. Don't stop. He feels disconnected. He feels disconnected. Christine, you're getting all this, right? Yes. Okay. Good girl. All right. What else? He's longing to be loved. What else? Aiming to please. Aiming to please. He He's what? He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Okay, Christine, you're getting all of this, right? Okay. Why me? Hmm? Why me? Why me? All right. Anybody else? And there's some drug abuse. Maybe some drug abuse related difficulties, okay. And were you gonna raise your hand? Something about the green, you know, this lush green behind them. Um, I don't know what it's everything apparently back there looks very middle class or upper, you know. What can I say? Um, well taken care of or something back there. But I'm feeling you feel like there's a disconnect, right? Yeah. There's a dissonance. There's a dissonance between him and his background. Is that what you're saying? Okay, dissonance between him and his background. I'm thinking it has to do with other people. They disconnect from people. Okay, it has to do with other people and a disconnect with other people. We're going to move on unless there's any other burning, burning, Impression from anybody who hasn't maybe given us one yet? I think he would be saying, let me go. Ah, I think he would be saying, let me go. Yes. I feel like he's let someone down so much that he just has to, like... She, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah feels that he feels he let somebody down so much that he... He needed to do something about it. He, he needed to what? He needed to do something about it, whether that be negative. He needed to do something about it. Okay, look at how much we've gotten from opening our field to his field, and look how we've been working as a unified field. So now, let's set sin and open our awareness to this next photo of the same man. What do you sense about him now? Commitment. Commitment. What's that? I can't hear. You gotta yell it. Compassion. What do you sense? Or 
around him? Like, what's his relationship to his surroundings? People have their backs to him. Christine, write that one down. So you feel he's still carrying what he was carrying before, and it's an undefined what? Sadness? Dramatic and traumatic. Traumatic. Anybody else? Possibly not his fault, but thrown into what? Something larger than himself? Ah, what are you sensing about the larger field he's belonging to? Because we've gotten disconnect. He's still disconnected. We've gotten mask. We've gotten backs on him. What is his, what do you feel is his relationship to his larger field? Marsha, were you going to say something? Well, I said, uh, and this disconnect is still there. I don't, I just kind of thought that, um, and I don't know where it's coming from, that, you know, maybe he's come back and, and it, he just doesn't fit in here. Maybe he what would come maybe back? Maybe he's come back from war or something and he's, you know, he's just, doesn't fit in. Okay, so let's put that down. Maybe he's come back and he doesn't fit in. Um, okay, so we're getting shame. We're getting that's the second. Well, you told me he said that at the same time. What, maybe gay? Okay, so we're getting shame and maybe gay. I know. Who saw? still seems to have some pride and commitment. Say that again. He has some pride. Oh, he has pride and commitment? To what he's, uh, <laughs> to what he's involved in. Yeah. Okay. So you're sensing pride and commitment. I yes. See, I see recovery. You see recovery? Okay. Yes. I know something you don't know, and I don't like it. I know something you don't know, and I don't like it. Okay, we're going to move on. This is really, really in-depth contact. You guys are doing great. What do you feel about this man now? Can you tell me about the field he's in now? He looks chastened. He looks chastened. He's come down a notch. Has he been tortured? What do you feel? That's a good question to ask. Go inside, and what do you feel when you ask that question? And where do you feel it? Feet down, more emotionally. I'm sorry? Feet down, I get more emotionally and spiritually than physical. Beaten down emotionally and spiritually. Yes, Sarah? Um, I, I don't know why, but I feel like this is more positive than the other two. I don't That's interesting. So Sarah's feeling this is more positive than the other two. Do you feel like maybe he's manifesting his purpose in this picture more? I feel like he'd been pent up before and now he's sort of let go a bit, even ah. though it might have not have been. So you're sensing a paradox here. He'd been pent up. And yet now when we're, he physically looks more restricted, he's feeling more let go. This is very interesting. So what might that tell you about the larger field he belongs to? Do you think maybe he belongs to more than one field in this picture? Um, by the change of scenery, I guess. And, and by what else? By the, his feelings. Do you think he belongs with this figure to the right? No. No. What do you think his relationship with that figure might be? Negative. Negative. Okay, we're going to go on. This man is Bo Bergdahl. So, what fields does he belong to? And how does his circumstance reflect the larger fields? Prior to enlisting in the Army, Bergdahl was discharged from the United States Coast Guard for psychological reasons. The circumstances of his disappearance 
uh, uh, Pentagon investigation in 2010 concluded that he walked away from his unit. He wrote to his parents that he had become disillusioned with the war effort and bothered by the treatment of Afghans by American soldiers. He said in his email he was ashamed to be American. Some sources say he left an explanatory note before leaving, though this was denied. For months, U.S. negotiators sought to arrange the transfer of five Taliban detainees held in Guantanamo Bay detention camp to the Persian Gulf state of Qatar. The transfer was intended as one of a series of confidence-building measures designed to open the door to political talks between the Taliban and Afghan President Hamid Karzai's government. Berdal's parents fought for his release despite great debate that negotiating his release might signal to terrorists around the world a greater incentive to take U.S. hostages. On June 25, 2014, the U.S. Army stated that there is no evidence that Berdal engaged in any misconduct during his years in captivity. The Pentagon investigation referred to the above dealt with events leading up to his capture. In July 2014, Berdal was returned to active duty. In August, it was announced that an investigation headed by General Kenneth Dahl is continuing with a possible court-martial. According to a senior U.S. official, Berdal told military officials that he had been tortured, beaten, and held in a cage by his Taliban captors in Afghanistan after he tried to escape. He told medical officials that he was locked in a metal cage in total darkness for weeks at a time as punishment for trying to escape. So, recollecting now what you received as data, how accurate would you say our collective read was on what this young man has gone through? I would say we picked up a lot, and I would say there is a paradox here because there is a split intention in both the fields he was belonging to. And both those fields were colliding. So let's come back to Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point for a minute, okay? He says the tipping point is that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. In the end, tipping points are a reaffirmation of the potential for change and the power of intelligent action. Look at the world around you. It may seem like an immovable, implacable place. It's not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be tipped. David Bohm, British physicist, calls this tipping point place the zero point field. The mother of all fields, it provides the ultimate holographic blueprint for all time, past, present, and future. It is this that we tap into when we see into the past or the future. It's this that we tap into when we do quantum healing. Bohm's theory of the implicate order states that everything in the world is enfolded in this quantum subatomic flux or implicate state until it's made explicit meaning until it comes out into manifestation. So it, it, until something solidifies, it's eternally in flux as a possibility. He views time as a larger part, uh, as part of a larger reality which could project many sequences or moments into consciousness, not necessarily in linear order, which means if you think you had a past life, it's occurring now. It didn't happen back then. It's occurring simultaneously. So does this remind you of the Picasso effect? Moments separated in time are also projections of this larger reality. So one has to work with probabilities rather than certainties because it's impossible for an observer to describe all aspects of a particle at once. The theory of the implicate order contains an ultra-holistic cosmic view. It connects everything with everything else. That's how you knew about this young man now. And you knew what was going on with him then. The central underlying theme of Bohm's theory is the unbroken wholeness of the totality of existence as an undivided flowing movement without borders. 
I believe that when we enter the zero point field flux that we open the gateway to possibility and the making of miracles. Whether we call it simple prayer or presence or quantum healing, we can shift quantum possibility into probability or make explicit that which was implicate by activating what Einstein called the observer effect. That's why just being with someone can be so important. When we're witnessed in our life, when we're observed, when we observe something, we can affect a change upon it just with the act of observing. Bohm believes that the individual who uses this inner energy and intelligence can transform mankind. So time-displaced human intention somehow acts upon the probabilities of some occurrence to bring about an outcome and works best on seed moments, the first of a chain of events. So consider the ramification of working with the zero-point field can have on disease process as well as a life process. We can access a seed moment where a natural killer cell might exist in a 50-50 probability probabilistic state to either kill or ignore cancer cells. That first decision might make the difference between illness and health. There may be innumerable ways we can use intention in the future to change possibilities in the present, which could affect whether the disease develops into a full stage four manifestation or goes into spontaneous remission. So which moment is a seed moment? I'll give you a clue, there's only one moment, and that moment is now. So my first uh, recognition of a seed moment happened in my third year anatomy and physiology class at the Barbara Brennan School of Healing. And, um, oh, okay, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, the reason I selected uh, Bo Bergdahl is because I had a seed moment with him myself. After the news media had talked about his parents reaching out for help, many people started to pray for him. And I uh, got together with um, uh, a friend, another healer, and we started to presence him at a distance and start to give him healings. And um, what occurred during the healings was a series of communications, and the first started with a dog. Um, this dog, I sensed into a dog, and the dog's like, this dude is in a cage. He is a domesticated person. So I knew before the media had even released details uh, about him being in a cage, that he was in fact in a cage and I got the information from a dog. Okay, sounds pretty bizarre, right? But that's how it arrived to me. I started to feel into him and I could feel his spinal cord. I knew that he was being starved and beaten and I could sense into his physical condition. When I held him in his healing, I attempted to access the zero point field and when I did I got an image of a young boy and I got the image of a young boy talking to a grandfather figure and what occurred to me was that there might be a possibility that the stress of holding a hostage in a village might hurt the village population and that that dissonance with inflicting suffering on another human being might be just enough um, uh, stimulus to build a wave of wanting to release him. Um, about a week after that healing, uh, I felt he was on the road and he was being transferred. And in fact, he was at that time, when we looked back on the timeline, we knew he was being taken across the mountains and he was brought to another village, and ultimately uh, he was neg uh, the negotiations um, affected his release. But 
what happens when we use our own field to resonate our intention or to create a tip for another human being or even in an event in our own life? What might happen when, like a surfer, we open ourselves to a seed moment in the zero-point field and catch a wave? And the thing about a wave is you don't know where it's going to end up. You just catch it, and it's going to go on its own. But as an observer, you might just be able, by the act of your intention, cause something to particulate or manifest where in fact it might not have. And what if we could ride that wave to particulate or manifest a possibility into a probability? To manifest a desired or new reality? So we're going to conclude with a group exercise. And last time we sorted ourselves into two fields and we experienced what it felt to resonate an emotion from one group into another. And actually, Fiona was here observing that and she had an interesting observation sitting apart from the field, being an observer of the field. Do you want to share how it felt to you? Um, well, when uh, the, when people Can you, you want to stand up? Okay. Well, I don't remember the particulars. Use the microphone. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, there were two groups. I think it was um, like an inner circle and an outer circle. And I think initially the group was asked to send good thoughts. One one group was sending good thoughts to the other. One group sent uh, resonated hostility, and and then they swapped right. out, and the other group resonated um, compassion. Yeah, definitely um, the compassion felt warm, but the hostility felt very abruptly cold and, and harsh. And and you were uh, and I was sitting. Over she there was way right over now. there. This was happening. And the group is actually over here. So yeah, thank you. Today, let's continue our experiment with resonating a field, but this time with particular intention. So, as we start to create um, an intention in our own field, what are some of the ways that we can create coherency in a field? What are some of the things we do when we gather with other people and we want to unify ourselves? Set an intention. We set an intention. What else do we do? We kind of open ourselves up. We open ourselves up. How do you do that? Ah, she's pointing to her heart, isn't she? Yeah, that is a great way to open yourself to somebody else. What else do we do? Eye contact, right? Eye contact is good. Heart contact is good. What else? Speaking to each other. Shared vibration is a good way to unify a field. Look at all the um, religious services. They have a lot in common, don't they? Including singing together, right? When we share a vibration, whoops, such as in song, um, we're, we're literally vibrating to the same frequency. And we resonate. And, and we resonate not only in ourselves, but in one another. Um, what do we do when we say the Pledge of Allegiance? We put our hand on our heart, don't we? We all say together, we all look at the same symbol, we take the same symbol in. So we're bringing our nation into our heart, right? And we're accessing our heart field. And then we're creating a vibration that resonates with a large group of people. So. If we were to start to organize in, in 
a field, how would you maybe want to physically position yourself? What's that? In a circle. Good idea. Let's do it. Um, let's try one big circle for now. And what I want to do is I want to experiment with sound and use sound as a frequency to unify us. So I'm going to start to play a sound and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Can you hear that? Is it over here? This may have gone off. of God. So I'd like you to sing Hugh together with this, and I'm going to turn it up. Sure. 
all right? Now, chakra spins always change. All right, so this is the root chakra. So we have a small diagonal. You see that? Okay. So now we're going to go to her second chakra. Fairly still. Now we're going to go to the third. resonance or how would you like to view it with an intention? Go for the intention? Okay, so I'm going to pass this around starting with Marsha and we all have core qualities, all right? You might have a core quality of kindness or intelligence or loyalty or discernment, or trust, or trustworthiness. You might be very sympathetic. So just pass it around and pick one of your core qualities that you're going to send into this group. And what's your name? Wendy. And Wendy's going to be our little litmus test, right? <laughs> to see how our intention lands, all right? So what core quality would you like to share? Compassion. Okay. Humility, kindness, joy, positive thinker, analytical, happiness, understanding, curiosity. Simplicity. Empathy. Open hearted. Creativity. Participatory. Feeling. Trustworthy. Open. Okay. So now I'm going to ask each of you to hold that core quality, and remember you saw the field, it's about two and a half feet behind you, I want you to resonate it like a tuning fork and let it expand, allow it to travel around the group, and allow it to go where it wants to, and we'll see how it affects Wendy. And you're going to do it with the sound of hue, right? You're going to vibrate.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. 